Assalamu alaikum and good day everyone. I am Nurhanesi Abu Bakar and for this presentation, I'm going to discuss the determination of interest rate and structure of interest rate. Companies raise capital in two main forms. We have debt and equity. So in a free economy, capital like other items is allocated through a market system where funds are transferred and prices are established. So looking back, when we say interest rates, they are prices. These are the price na binabayaran natin for the use of money for a period of time and they are expressed as a percentage of the total outstanding balance that is either fixed or variable. Actually, there are two ways by which interest rate can be defined. First is a point of view ng borrower. For them, it is the cost of borrowing money or simply the borrowing rate. Second is a point of view naman ng lender. Sa lender naman, it is the fee charge for lending money or simply the lending rate. Now, how are interest rates classified? So generally, they are classified according to the tenor or the maturity period. We have short term for less than one year and then long term for more than one year. Aside from that, interest rates differ depending on the type of instruments. Example is the traditional deposit instruments like savings deposit, time deposit, and then for investment instruments naman like bonds, securities. So that one, the type of instruments is magkaibay ba sila ng interest rates. Now, what are the role of interest rate in finance? So, of course, finance deals with funds. These funds generally denote money and based sa definition ng interest rate natin a while ago, it is therefore clear that interest rate plays a major role in finance. Then the changes in interest rates have implications for a multitude of phenomena in the business and economic world. So what are these phenomena? We have the level of investment spending, the level of consumer expenditure, the prices of financial securities are among the ones na affected by any change sa interest rate natin. They either go with the direction of the interest rate or go against it. Like, they could have a direct relationship or an inverse relationship. And later on, we will discuss more about this. And of course, interest rate is one of those monetary tools na ginagamit ng central banks to control money supply, demand supply for money, among others to maintain a healthy and stable economy. Now, there are various factors in the economy that determine interest rate. We have inflation expectations, savings and investment demand, money demand and money supply, government's monetary policy, and business cycles. First, let's discuss the inflation expectations. So, when there is an inflation, of course, there is a continual increase in price of goods and services. So, over time, kapag uh, merong inflation, the cost of products and services increases and then the value of money decreases. Mas naging less valuable na yung money. So as for finance lending sector, kapag may inflation, mas advantageous siya sa part ng borrowers. Kaya mas attractive for them to borrow money but less attractive naman for the lenders. Since as I've mentioned a while ago, when there's an inflation, mas maliit na yung value ng money. So, at that time, it take advantage ng borrower. On the other hand, si lender naman is that uh, mag ma experience sila ng loss since the value of money now has fallen as compared to the time nung nagpa-borrow sila ng pera. So, in order to compensate this loss, lenders have to increase the interest rate. Meaning, a higher expected inflation where the value of money decreases, a higher interest rates. And vice versa, when expected inflation goes down, interest rate usually falls. And this is supported by the loanable funds theory. Now, what is this loanable funds theory? This theory suggests that the market interest rates are determined by the factors that control the supply and demand for the loanable funds. This theory is simply based on the premise that interest rate is the price paid for the right to borrow or use loanable funds. So, sino ba yung nagokontrol ng mga supply and demand for the loanable funds? Of course, the borrowers and the lenders. Wherein yung mga borrowers, sila yung nagde-demand for the funds and yung mga lenders naman yung nagsusupply or nagpo-provide ng loanable funds needed by the borrowers. And this interplay of supply and demand for loanable funds determines the interest rate. 
So yung mga households, businesses, including foreign entities, and government participate in both sides of the market. They are all borrowers and lenders at one time or the other. So, paano ba naapektuhan ng supply and demand for the loanable funds yung interest rate natin? Now, to sum it up, in this theory, it only states that a reduction in the supply and an increase in demand for loanable funds moves the interest rate up. And vice versa, an increase in the supply and a decrease in demand for loanable funds moves the interest rate down. Next one, we have savings and investment demand. This one is supported by classical theory. This theory argues that the rate of interest is determined by two forces. First is the supply of savings, which is derived mainly from households. Although businesses and governments also save, but mainly talaga is from households. And then second, we have demand for investment capital coming mainly from the business sector, although households also invest. This theory therefore highlights the importance of households and businesses. So, when we say savings, these are generally done by individuals and families or the households. For them kasi, savings are simply an abstinence from consumption spending or savings are equal to income minus consumption expenditures. Now, the level of savings also affects interest rate. The higher the interest rate is on deposits and other investment alternatives, the higher the tendency is to save and invest. Because in my households, they know that they will earn more in terms of interest. And actually, the only way to encourage an individual or family to consume less now and save more is to offer a higher rate of interest and in current savings. Kasi if more were saved now, sa current period at a higher rate of return, future consumption and future enjoyment would be increased. Kasi through the interest na na-earn natin on current savings, it will give the households more to spend in the future. So this gives way to the positive relationship between the interest rate and the volume of savings. On the other hand, interest is the price of investment because firms borrow money for investment. Now, also investment depends on interest rate. A low interest rate encourages high investment and a high interest rate leads to reduction in investment. So we can say that Unlike the supply of savings, investment is inversely related to interest rate. Next, we have money demand and money supply. So in here, it is also supported by the liquidity preference theory. In 1930, John Maynard Keynes introduced the concept of money demand and used the term liquidity preference for money demand. Now, this theory stipulates that the interest rate is determined in the money market by the money demand and the money supply. Now, let's take a look at the interrelationship among interest rate, demand for money, and supply of money. Now, as we can see, when the interest is high, the demand for money is low, and then the supply of money is high. On the other hand, when there is a reduction naman sa interest rate, the demand for money is high, and then sa part naman ng supply of money is low. In short, the relationship between interest and demand is inverse, and the relationship between demand and supply is inverse also, whereas the relationship between interest rate and supply is direct. Now, this theory gives insights into how investor behaves and how the government uses interest rate as a monetary tool. Sa part kasi ng investors, they will purchase securities kapag yung interest rate is high. Of course, for the simple reason of gain. And then, mag-increase yung supply of funds nila sa financial system. And then, kapag yung interest rate naman is low, they will not buy securities, thereby reducing the supply of funds in the financial system. Similarly, sa part naman ng government, they can regulate the money supply, ensuring that it grows more slowly than money demand to bring about higher interest rate. Next, we have government's monetary policy. So as discussed from the previous topic, monetary policy largely impacts interest rate. The central bank uses certain monetary policy to influence availability of loans through the banks and then to encourage loan granting by banks and other financial institutions that the government will decrease interest rate to encourage borrowing. So monetary policy decisions involve setting the interest rate on loans in the money market because as we all know, the official goals of monetary policy usually include relatively stable rates and low unemployment.
Lastly, we have business cycle. In here, to restrain economic activity, interest rate is increased to discourage borrowing which could have otherwise caused an increase in production. As such, interest rate follows the business cycle. Now, interest rate rises during expansion phase of the business cycle and falls during the period of recession. Remember, when we say expansion period, there is an increase in the level of economic activity and of the goods and services available. Meanwhile, kapag sinabi naman natin recession, it is a period of decline, slowdown, or a massive contraction in general economic activity. So, this increase and decrease in the interest rate kapag expansion period and recession period is actually true for short-term interest rate. Kasi during expansion period, the demand for funds grows, pushing interest rate up, and then the demand for funds falls during contraction or during recession naman. Moving on, let's discuss what composes the interest rate or what is the formula to get the interest rate. In general, the quoted or nominal interest rate on a debt security is composed of a real risk free rate plus several premiums that reflect inflation like the securities risk, its liquidity or marketability, and the years to its maturity. This relationship can be expressed as follows. We have R is equal to R star plus DRP plus LP plus MRP plus IP, where R is the nominal or quoted interest rate in a given security, and then R star, this is pronounced as R star, it is the real risk-free rate of interest, and it is the rate that would exist on a risk-less security in a world where no inflation was expected. By the way, when we say risk-free interest rate, these are the interest rates that are paid or charged on a risk-free instrument, one that has absolutely no risk or zero risk, meaning you're gonna get paid regardless, parang walang chance na hindi mabayaran yung interest and principal na nilend out mo sa isang company. DRP is the default risk premium. Itong premium na to, it reflects the possibility or yung chances na si issuer will not pay the interest or the principal at the stated time and in the stated amount. Well, LP is the liquidity premium. Itong premium naman to, ito yung china charge to compensate the fact na some securities cannot be converted to cash on a short notice at a reasonable price. LP or the liquidity premium is relatively high on securities issued by small firms. Then MRP is the maturity risk premium. This premium reflects interest rate risk or ito yung premium na china charge to compensate the risk from probability or yung mga chances in the interest rates that might cause capital losses. Lastly, IP is the inflation premium. Ito yung premium which is equal to the average expected rate of inflation over the life of the security. Now let's proceed to the structure of interest rate. This is the relationship between interest rates or bond yields and different terms or maturities. This is also known as yield curve. And this reflects the expectations of market participants about future changes in interest rates and their assessment of monetary policy conditions. So, structure of interest rates simply describes the relationship between long-term rates and short-term rates. This is actually important sa mga corporate treasurers in deciding whether bibili sila ng long-term debt or short-term debt. And then sa investors naman, whether they will buy long-term bonds or short-term bonds. In general terms, yields increase in line with maturity giving rise to the three primary shapes. First, we have upward sloping. In here, long-term yields are higher than short-term yields. And as you can see, the curve slopes upwards and it is also known as positive or normal yield curve. And kapag yung curve natin is normal or positive, in general, it indicates that investors desire a higher rate of return for taking an increased risk of lending their money over a longer period of time. And this signals that the economy is in an expansionary mode, which means that yung mga investors na they will expect strong future economic growth with higher future inflation, which means higher interest rates. Second, we have downward sloping. In here, if short-term yields are higher than long-term yields, the curve slopes downward and this is called a negative or inverted yield curve. And this one signifies that the economy is in or about to enter a recessive period. 
wherein yung mga investors na they will expect sluggish or a very slow economic growth with lower future inflation and thus lower interest rates. And lastly, we have flat. A flat yield curve exists when there is little to no variation between short and long-term yield rates. A flat curve generally indicates that investors are unsure about future economic growth and inflation. Now, in real life, the term structure of interest rate is rarely horizontal over the time. As you can see, the benchmark interest rates either rise or decline as the maturity of debt increases. In other words, the flat yield curve is a theoretical behavior of the interest rate in the perfect capital market, and this rarely happens. Now, let's take a look at this example. We have yields of government securities in the secondary market. By the way, when I say secondary market, it is where investors buy and sell securities they already own. And sa secondary market, yung pinaka recently auctioned treasure issue is considered current or on the run. And yung mga current issues na to are more actively traded and more liquid sila. So, typically, uh, they are traded at lower yields. So, in here, as you can see, sa x-axis, we have the time to maturity from 3 months to 25 years government securities. And then sa y-axis naman, we have yields in percent. Now, for March 2019, the yields for government securities in the secondary market increased from 3 months to 1 year. Then, a sudden drop after but rose again for the 10-year government securities. Then, for December 2019, the yields for government securities kept on rising. On the other hand, as of end March 2020, the yields for government securities in the secondary market rose generally, except for the 20-year and 25-year government securities. Now, who determines the structure of interest rates? So, the structure of interest rates is calculated and published by the Wall Street Journal, the Federal Reserve, and a variety of other financial institutions. On Wall Street, yung mga yield curve is ginagamit sila to predict yung mga changes in economic output and growth. The bond yields of both short-term and long-term debt securities tend to reveal a lot about the economy of any nation where government-issued debt is considered reliable investment security. So that's it for my report. Thank you and wassalam.